Hey everyone, Mo is here from Wall Street from Main Street, and today we have a returning guest, and we're going to talk about the real estate market, which is something we haven't talked about in a while. Uh, today's guest is Cassie Feske. He is a co- she is a co-founder of the Real Wealth Network. Cassie, thank you for coming back. Ah, oh, thanks for having me. So I want to start off uh, this podcast by talking about uh, a sector in a real estate that starting to. Uh, uh, getting some traction in, in the news, I noticed, within the real estate sector, and that's the commercial real estate. Um, if you look at the commercial property price index, it had, and you mentioned it in one of your articles, it had doubled from uh, 2009, and it's way higher than uh, the peak of 2007 before we saw the housing bubble uh, collapse. So yeah. what does that mean for the commercial ind- real estate industry and Real estate as a whole, and I notice that because when I go to the mall, I start I see a lot of clo- uh, stores closing down, and I see restaurant downsizing as well. So I'm thinking yeah. this is part of it. Well, the commercial real estate world, see the CRE world, is so big, so diverse that you can't really put it in one category as to whether it's doing well or not. Certain sectors are okay and others are really, really dangerous right now. So you just have to know which one is is a, a buying opportunity and which is time to sell and get out. Unfortunately, investors get it wrong almost every time. They come in at the end, at the peak, buy at the top when cap rates are low and right before prices are about to soften. And uh, usually they're the ones who take the hit. So I'm out trying to tell people, please be cautious because commercial real estate overall is, it, it, it has just gone up like crazy. Apartments, man, it's tough to find an apartment with a with a, a high cap rate. Every, everything's in the 2 to 5% range. And in California, it might be in the negative cap rate range. <laughs> so, you know, again, depending on what you're investing in, you got to be careful. Retail, retail for sure is something to be cautious of. So when when you you mentioned cap rate for people that are not uh, familiar with real estate industry, what does that mean? It's just basically the return. I don't I don't know why they have to use different language that nobody understands. But you know when you say a two cap, that means you're getting a two percent return after all expenses, and that's. Why, you know, why take all the risk of real estate if you're getting a 2% return? You might as well just stick it in the bank. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> right. So you're saying the commercial real estate, the returns is between 2 to 5%. Uh, you know, and that's it's such a generalization. Yeah. I, I There's a couple of commercial deals that we're really interested in right now. Uh, one is dollar stores uh, because right now you've got, um, you know, not the strongest economy, despite what some people like to say or think or believe. Um <laughs> So dollar stores are doing well, and and medicals doing well, and and certain retail centers uh, that have have services that can't be outsourced. So if you want to have a massage, you're gonna you're gonna go and get one. You can't order it on Amazon, but if you're gonna buy a dress, I'll tell you what. Every single girl that went to the prom this year at my daughter's school, they bought their dresses online. When I bought a prom dress 30 years ago, we went to Macy's. So there's a there's a shift happening where you know certain retail. Um, you know, is going to go down because it's all going online, which means that warehouses are going to go up because online stores need warehouses. So there's just a lot of shift happening and you need, I did say shift, <laughs> and you, you need to be aware so you don't get in at the wrong time. Yeah, the uh, the economy is revolving. Uh, a lot of people are going away from brick and mortar to online shopping. And like you mentioned, uh, the demand for warehouses is going up uh Right for you know companies like Amazon that have fulfillment centers all over the country and all over the world now I think uh, yeah. so so yeah the economy is revolving nothing ever stays the same we have social media now online e-commerce so the brick and mortar like Macy they're they're shifting their focus from uh, their store to online business now uh, despite the fact that they have some prime real estate uh, in a lot of downtown areas throughout the country, like New York City and D.C. and L.A., uh, I think that's something that's keeping Macy uh, their value up, in my opinion, their commercial real estate property. 
Do you agree? I don't know if you ever looked in, into Macy's real estate uh, asset portfolio. Well, I know that they've been closing some stores and, you know, repositioning. But right now, retail's just a hard business to be in because more and more people are finding they can type in what they want on a computer and bam, there it is. They don't have to go running around looking for it and dealing with parking and walking through a mall. I mean, you know, not everybody wants to do that and people are busy. So, uh, but at the same time, like I said, medical is booming and any kind of retail centers where you're going to get your nails done or you're going to get a massage or, uh, you know, maybe go get some Botox or whatever. Right. I mean, yeah. these are the, you can't outsource that yet. <laughs> no, you can't. So you're saying like the, uh, the service oriented retail will still be around. So that's, that's keeping the commercial real estate, uh, uh, afloat uh, for now, but in terms of the commercial real estate uh, in general, uh, I read an article that if that if the uh, commercial real estate goes down, that could be a domino effect for the whole economy. That could it could really bring down the uh, the economy. Uh, do you agree or disagree with that? We're going to see a major reset this year. I I, I say that with. <laughs> With a, quite a lot of certainty, don't I? But the, the thing is, we've got um, loans that are ballooning this year. A lot of commercial loans are short term. They're not 30 year fixed rate mortgages like we have in residential. And so there is a, a time when those notes balloon. And what that means is you have to pay it. And, and so if your property is worth less than what you owe, if it's underwater, you're going to have a hard time refinancing. Or, you know, what are you going to do, sell? So we have $90 billion worth of commercial loans resetting this year with um, balloon notes that have to be paid. And unfortunately, about half of those, about $45 billion of those, um, they're, they're underwater. So there's going to be a lot of people stressing out at the very last minute trying to find a way to refinance those loans, but how are they going to do it if they owe more than the property is worth? They're not going to be able to do it. And and they're probably going to have to just market it and sell it, but who's going to buy it? Is is there a lender out there who will lend on it? And so uh, I do think that there's going to be an opportunity, again, depending on which way you look at this crisis, um, buyers have an opportunity in about six to 12 months to pick up on some really good deals or help these people with their financing in the same way that you could go into the short sell business 10 years ago and and do really well. Well, you can do that with commercial property over the next year or so, um, trying to restructure these loans because it may be that the banks don't want to take these properties back. Maybe they want to work with you uh, in a loan structuring. So opportunity exists for, for investors who know how to find it. Yeah, and I live in Northern Virginia, and right now this this the uh, real estate, commercial and re- residential, is still booming here, uh, mainly because uh, you know the government uh, spending is still going higher. So uh, yeah, that that's keeping our economy here in this area afloat. Like five minutes away from where I live, they're building a luxury townhome with a Wegman in there, a little community there. And then also we have like town centers, which are like mini cities that are popping up throughout the area of Northern Virginia. And then D.C., they're uh, building a waterfront not too far from uh, um, the mall, which is where uh, Washington Monument is and all the other monuments are. So... In this area, the commercial real estate is, is still booming. Uh, I would I would think that eventually that would uh, become un- unsustainable and come back down and cool off a little. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and yeah, you're in an area also where there's the expansion. I don't know if you're near it, but of the port there, um, which could affect the industry there. I don't know how close you are to the port, but. Uh. Uh. What is that again? I didn't hear that. Oh, um, you know, the Port of Virginia, or, or um, yeah, I believe is 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 having some major expansion. So. Oh yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's shift gears here and talk about um, residential real estate now. Sure. Um, for people that haven't been paying attention to the thirty-year mortgage rate, it has been it went up this fall of two thousand sixteen, almost a hundred basis point, but not quite. Uh, it, uh, hovering around above 4% for a 30-year uh, fixed mortgage rate. And um, I was also reading an article today, 
and this uh, analyst, a uh, real estate analyst, was saying how sensitive uh, home buyers are to the interest rate rise. He said that one percent uh, rate increase equals to eleven percent purchasing power loss for home buyers. So any increase in the mortgage rate means that the home buyers have to look for a cheaper home. Uh, so, could you see the higher interest rate killing the momentum in the housing market, or will it cause a boost since people may get off the couch and buy something before the interest rate goes up too high? You know, it's a little bit of both. We actually uh, have seen an increase in in um, existing home sales since rates went up. So, I think that's people saying, "Oh boy, I want to get in before rates go higher." Um, mostly. I would say 60% of the country is not going to be affected by rising interest rates because some parts of the country are still very, very affordable. It's more affordable to buy and own a home than to rent in, like I said, about 60% of the country. Now, you've got other markets, the coastal markets mainly, but also Denver and uh, Phoenix and and um, Dallas now. There's some there's some markets that have become pricier where uh, prices are are p- past affordability. And in that case, higher interest rates could affect those markets if people can no longer qualify. So I, I would be cautious about the higher price markets that have you know really challenged the affordability levels. But other areas, and again, most of the country is doing just fine. In fact. Uh, places like Houston, uh, interest rates could go up, I just read today, up to 12% and it wouldn't really affect the ability for people to buy because it's so affordable there. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I would guess the D.C. area is one of those areas where it's not uh, very affordable. Am I right? Which, where? The D.C. area, the Washington, D.C. Metro. That is very, very expensive, yeah. Home prices there are at... Uh, at, you know, past the 2006 highs in a lot of places. And um, so I, I would be cautious. But again, you can always find a deal. Right. Uh, it's just, you know, you're, you better find a deal in those markets. Otherwise, you're going to be paying too much. Right. And um, one city that's starting to make a comeback is Detroit. Uh, yeah. Uh, as people remember, a couple of years ago, Detroit uh, declared a bankruptcy and a lot of the street lights were or not working, or it was dark outside, so that hurt uh, the property value in downtown areas, and also the crime started to go up. Uh, but ever since then, we had investors, like the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers, uh, the guy that started uh, the little teaser pizza place. Uh, he also mm-hmm. invested in, in uh, downtown Detroit, and it's starting to come back to life a little bit. So what is your outlook for Detroit? Is that something that people should look into if they want to start investing, or if they have uh, invested in real estate, should they look into Detroit area? Yeah, you know, at Real Wealth Network, we have just added Detroit as one of our hot markets. Uh, it's on our hot market list, helping investors buy there. And I didn't think we would jump back into Detroit because it was really just, ooh, it looked like it had a long, hard path before uh, it could recover. But bankruptcy was actually the best thing that ever happened to that city. Letting go of that debt and the restructuring uh, has has actually been very good for the city. And then, like you said, a couple of, I think like three billionaires now are investing heavily into the downtown area, each investing about $2 billion to to revitalize. And now it's become a bit of a millennial hotspot it's kind of a cool place to be, and uh, we, we're still cautious about many, many parts of Detroit, but there are pockets and suburbs where you can get amazing cash flow, but you really have to have boots on the street. You need a local expert, right. which, of course, is what, what we do. We find local experts in all these areas, and we refer our, our listeners and our members at Real Wealth Network because otherwise, if you found something online, you know, you think, oh, this looks like a good deal. It could it could be really something that bites you back pretty hard. Yeah, and that, that's the thing about bankruptcy. In the short term, it's bad, but in the long term, it, it cleans out the the system, so to speak. Uh, it allowed people, to, you know, to start from scratch. So Detroit just kind of started from scratch and allowed it, and allowed a uh, billionaire investor to come in and try to uh, fix things up rather than having the government do it. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, bankruptcy is not a bad thing all the time. 
No, it's it's uh it's there for a reason. And uh unfortunately, you know, people who lend money uh need to be cautious who they're lending to because bankruptcy is always a, a possibility. But uh you know, in this case, uh, you know, clearly Detroit pensions and everything got out of control, although I don't think those got touched, but uh yeah, it's been a good thing for that city. Chicago maybe next, who knows. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of cities are in the same boat in Detroit in terms of uh, the liability that they have in terms of their pensions. So uh, we should definitely see a lot more Detroit coming down in the future, unfortunately. But it will provide opportunities for people to come in and uh, invest and try to rebuild the community. Um, so let's talk about your home state, which is California. Now, uh, you live in the southern part of California. Uh, how the real estate uh, in that area compared to 10 years ago before the housing bubble uh, collapsed? Are, are there any similarities to the price in the atmosphere uh, and the demand and the supply uh, compared to 10 years ago? You know, ten, right now the California housing market feels so much like 2006. The The difference is that uh, back then, there were crazy loans, you know, just just ridiculous loans that didn't make sense. That is not the case today, so that's the good news. Um, but, but so so then, why are prices up to to beyond 2006 levels? Well, in San Francisco, you know, you had a lot of foreign money coming in. You have a lot of venture capital money that was just you know writing big big checks to any any high tech idea that came along. Um, so those people, those young entrepreneurs could go lease out office space and hire people. And of course, those people were getting paid more than they normally would because there were these massive venture capital checks uh, funding all of these deals. Now, venture capital is pulled back. So um, and the foreign investment is pulled back. So I think that San Francisco is in a gigantic bubble. I've been telling everyone I know it's time to sell unless you plan on staying there for a long time. Uh, a lot of people say you can never lose money in California, but that's just, that's crazy. If you bought in 2006 in California, in many parts of California, you're still waiting for your value to come back to the price that you paid. Um, now there's, again, certain pockets where it's gone beyond that, but, um, but only by maybe 10, 20%. So that means that in, in a 10 year period in California, you maybe made a 20% growth, uh, because it, it dipped so much. So it feels a lot like 2006, 2007. People need to really ask themselves, what would I have done differently in 2007 if someone had told me that there was going to be a major financial crisis a year later? Uh, that's very much possible today that we could have a major financial crisis this summer or next year or the year after. We know it's coming. We just don't know when. So you've got to be defensive and offensive in your in your investing strategies and any decision you make it needs to be one that takes that into consideration so did you uh see the housing bubble come in 2006 2007 uh were you prepared for that housing bubble collapse oh absolutely we we absolutely knew it was coming because it was so obvious i was in the loan business i could give a loan to anybody they didn't have to show me anything and I, and I, I was new to the loan business, so I didn't know that wasn't normal. But I, but I had the Real Well show at the time. Uh, I was one of the first podcasters, and it was that platform that allowed me to interview people who had been in, in real estate much longer than me for, for 20, 30, 40 years. And they told me, oh, you know, it's absolutely nuts. And so it wasn't that I was so brilliant. It's that I, I interviewed brilliant people on my show. And, and so they warned us. And they, they said, oh, yeah, we're absolutely selling out of these bubble markets and we're buying in Texas because Texas had the opposite cycle. They were at the beginning of their boom cycle just when California had peaked. So people who listened to my show had the unique opportunity to sell at the peak, cash in all that money, and then buy at the trough in Dallas at the lowest price point just when that market was about to take off. So those people were able to triple or quadruple the, their cash flow and enjoy a pre price appreciation for 10 years. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at again today. California's peaked, as have many of the coastal cities, but there's inland cities that have not yet. So you have this opportunity to sell at the peak, cash in your chips, and go invest somewhere where it makes more sense. 
Uh, why is it that Texas uh, did not experience a housing bubble while the rest of the country was uh, peaking in terms of home prices uh, 10 years ago? Yeah, isn't that funny? Um, you know, Texas got wiped out in the 80s during the SNL crisis and the oil crisis, and it was just, it got hit hard. And they were mostly dependent on oil. And uh, and so leadership came into, into Dallas and Houston and said, we're not going to go through that again. And we're not going to, you know, we're not going to mess around, around with banking because the SNL crisis wiped them out. And so they were very, very strict on their lending. They did not allow some of the crazy loans that other states were doing. Now, at the time in 2006, as a, as a loan broker, Nobody wanted to do loan business in Texas because of their strict rules, but it turned out to be very good for them. So that's one reason. They weren't doing some of the crazy stuff that other places were doing. The other reason is that um, it, it was all new. The, the, the government had said, hey, we're going to make this a place where businesses want to come. We're going to give them tax incentives, and then if – if businesses come here, people will come here. And so that was kind of the beginning of all that. Like so many businesses were moving their headquarters to Dallas and people were moving there, but home prices had not caught up with all that yet. So it was just, it was like for, for us, we learned, and this is the biggest lesson I've learned and I, I use it today, is that don't look at the past, look at the future. So if you looked at the past, you'd say, oh, my gosh, nothing happens in Texas. What a terrible place to invest. And that's what everybody was telling me when I was telling people to invest there. But what we saw coming was all these new jobs, all these new people, and, and ho low home prices. We knew that something would have to change. And with all those people coming into town, there wouldn't be enough new construction to keep up. And when that happens... You know, it doesn't matter how much land there is in Texas. It's how much you can build and how quickly. And nobody can build as quickly as the population was growing. And so uh, pr home prices have doubled, if not tripled, in the areas where our investors bought. Uh, that's very interesting. I did not know that Texas uh, did not experience a housing bubble uh, back then. Uh, but where where did the uh, real estate bubble in Texas now stand as of today? Uh, had it peaked like the rest of the country has, or is there still room to grow? Well, you know, a lot of people say, oh, my gosh, prices have gone up so much, and, you know, it's not affordable anymore. But, you know, if you're comparing cheap to a little little less cheap, you know, it's still cheap. You know, so if, if you, you could still buy a beautiful home in Dallas for $200,000, you're not going to find anything like that in California. You know, no way. Oh. Not, not, not near high-tech jobs and all these new jobs. So it's still very affordable. It's just that prices have gone way up, and, and the locals don't know what's happening. It's never happened to them before. Uh, but as long as job growth continues and as long as population growth continues, demand for housing is going to continue. And there's no sign of it slowing down at all. When you look at demographic shifts, you see you see more people. You see an exodus out of California, and those people are moving to Texas and Florida. Why? Because there's no state income tax in those areas. It's affordable. There's a warm climate, and you have you have 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 every single day. So if you're going to retire, are you going to retire in expensive California where you're going to get taxed like crazy and that affects you as a, a person on a fixed income? Or are you going to go to a place like Texas or Florida where you can still have nice weather and a nice lifestyle, uh, but you don't have to pay that state income tax and you can live, you know, you can afford to live. Yeah, I noticed a lot of people have been moving to Austin, Texas. That's becoming sort of like an entrepreneurial hub and, also yeah. and, a, and a booming uh, city as well. Yep, exactly. Uh, so where do you see the future for California in terms of their real estate and their economy? We're seeing a lot of business flock out of California and going to uh, places like you mentioned, Texas, Nevada, Arizona, places where it's more business-friendly. So you, you you do business and you live in California. Where do you see California headed uh, in the future? Uh, you know, there's parts of California that are still affordable. Um, Sacramento, Inland Empire, you know, there's still room to grow. But um, the coastal markets have probably hit their peak. We don't have a lot of foreign money coming in anymore. Uh, even, even the foreign money is realizing it's too expensive and they're going to other places. Um, like, like the markets that we're investing in at Real Wealth Network, it's the same, you know, the foreign investors are looking for yield and they're not finding it in California. So without that foreign money, 
I don't think that we're going to see price increases in California except in the affordable uh, housing levels, which <laughs> there isn't much. So, um, yeah, I, I think you can still get bargains inland. Now, the question is, with such a lack of inventory in California, will prices continue to rise? And I think it's I, I think the problem is that people are leaving. You know, there's if when you look at the charts, more people are leaving California than coming in. So I think that I think we've reached a top at, in California. And there's always exceptions. There's good deals you can find on properties, right. or if you Airbnb it, it might you might make some money. But right. you got to be careful. Uh, right. Um, so in the past, buying a home was considered a, the American part of the American dream. You know, people. Go to work to save money and to buy a nice home. Uh, do you still consider? Do you still think buying a home is a, in a part of the American dream in this country? Or and also, a lot of people consider buying a home as investment. I th- I think it's a lifestyle choice now because uh, we're never going to have that period like we had back during the housing bubble where everything went straight up really fast. And it, it, mm-hmm. people thought it's just going to keep going up. I mean, we still have that now in parts in parts of the area in this country, but it wasn't as bad as uh, a decade ago when everything uh, mm-hmm. throughout the country, except Texas, was going up. So, what is your thought about buying a home? Is it part of, still part of the American dream, and should it be considered as an investment or a lifestyle choice? Uh, you know, if you are planning on living in a in a property for a long time, then it makes total sense because you can lock in still a four and a quarter percent uh, interest rate or somewhere around there. That is very low. That's historically low. Um, and if you're gonna if you're gonna stay in that property, you're gonna have that same payment for ten, twenty, thirty years, depending on how long you live there. Now we know that rents are going up, so. Each time you make a house payment, you're paying down your your mortgage, and in 30 years, you end up with a, a home free and clear. So for people who, who think they're going to stay put, maybe they're getting married, they're going to stay put and raise their kids in that area, and they've got a steady job, absolutely um, buy. You know, it makes sense. But if you don't know where you're going to end up, then it might make more sense to rent and buy investment property instead. There are... 43 million renter households today in the U.S. and 111 renters within those households. Um, and household formation is grow. It's it's increasing. It's doubling this decade from last decade. So more and more households forming, but more and more of those are being are rentals. And and um, it turns out that only about three percent. This is shocking. Only about three percent of those forty-three million renters can afford, you know, can qualify for a loan. So we're going to have an increasing number of people who, whether they want to buy or not, they can't. They are going to be renters for a while, and somebody needs to own the property that they're going to rent. And and it just so turns out that there's baby boomers who would like to have that monthly income, right? So it's a it's a Great opportunity if you know how to rent property. This is the key. Don't just jump in, buy a property, rent it out, and think you're going to be okay. You have to learn how to do it. That's why I wrote the book Retire Rich with Rentals so that people don't make silly mistakes. You know, you need to be educated. But once you are, um, then then you can truly help solve a big problem, which is people need property and they need rental property. You can make a passive income in your retirement years or or even I, I've got, you know, millennials who are saying, I, I, I travel too much. I, I'm not going to be able to settle down, but I want to own property. So I'm going to buy a rental. Now I'm in the housing market, but I don't have to live in that house. I can rent it. And so, you know, there's there's a lot of different options. I can tell you the rental market's going to be strong for the next decade. And it's a great opportunity for those who educate themselves. So what advice do you have for people that want to get into a real estate uh, market, either to buy or to rent? And what areas, we talked about Detroit, what other areas do you like for people that want to buy and maybe uh, rent out? Yeah, we have that whole list on our website at realwealthnetwork.com. It's a a list of about 15 cities that we really like. Uh, I mentioned some of them earlier, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, uh, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, 
uh, Detroit. Uh, these are just to name a few. We like some some pockets of Chicago, uh, places where there's job growth and uh, renter pool of educated people with jobs that can pay you. Uh, Huntsville, by the way, Alabama, great market uh, because it's where uh, rocket ships are built and, and there's a lot of uh, rocket scientists there and yet you can buy a house for $150,000 and rent it to an engineer, you know. So lots and lots of opportunity. We have it all listed on our on our website and, and you know, what we like about those markets. Um, and then we, you know, I'm constantly telling people the markets that it's probably a really good time to get out of. Like I said, coastal markets, San Francisco for sure. Um, yeah, I've helped so many people realize they could sell one property in a bubble market and buy, you know, sometimes as many as 20 in, in these other emerging markets and, right. and cash flows can, yeah, I, I had one person, one lady just sold a rental in San Francisco for $2 million. She was getting maybe 7000 6000 a month. We're going to get her to 20000 a month. Wow. She's going to be managing 20 properties, but the way we've set it up is we have teams in all of these emerging markets who find the properties, renovate them, and then manage them. So it's it's about as turnkey as you can get as a landlord. It's not as turnkey as our rental fund where we manage all of it for you, but uh, that's an option too. Yeah, so let's talk about your service that you offer for our listeners. So people want to find out more about what you do and in, in your service if they want to get into real estate. Uh, tell us more. Sure. If you go to realwealthnetwork.com, you can join for free, and that will give you access to all the data I shared. You get get a referral to the teams in these different markets. Uh, they don't mark them up, and, and you don't pay extra for the service. We just get paid uh, as a real estate agent broker to broker fee. So it's just included in that normal real estate agent uh percent sales commission. And um and so uh you can get a refer you know, you can get um weekly webinars. You can sign up for that for free where we highlight different uh markets that are really booming right now. So you can do that all at realwealthnetwork.com. We also started our crowdfunding site and that's realwealthcrowd.com and that's for totally passive where maybe you just don't want to be a landlord. You just want to invest in in real estate and projects that where your money is secured to a hard asset like real estate, but you don't actually want to have to do anything. So we have those syndications where we manage it um, and you just invest. So that's Real Wealth Crowd and then uh, Real Wealth Network is our main site. Okay, great. Well, thank you for your time and uh, hopefully you can come back on again soon. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Mo and I are trying to raise $1,000 per month for our Patreon account. We have over 2,600 viewers per YouTube video, so if we can get most of our loyal listeners or all of our loyal listeners to donate a dollar per month or or up to $5 per month, which would be amazing, that would cover most, if not all, of the money that we need. So uh, we also accept one-time donations if you go to the Wall Street for MainStreet.com website. Uh, we accept donations in cash uh, via PayPal, fiat. You can donate there. Uh, you can donate uh, Bitcoin through our Bitcoin wallet there on the website, or you can donate gold and silver. We have a gold money account, and we also accept mail donations of physical gold and silver. Uh, thank you guys for listening, and uh, we appreciate any and all help. Please forward it to friends. Okay, bye.